Gospel of Luke, please, and chapter number 22. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22. Commence reading at verse number, for the sake of time, verse number 19. And he took bread and gave thanks, break, gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament or New Covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he was betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves, which of them should do this thing. And there was also strife among them, which of them should be the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are considered benefactors. But ye, not so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that to serve for. Whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you, as he that serveth. Then he goes on to explain to them in the verses that follow, gives them a, a look to the future of the coming kingdom. He reminds Simon of his own frailty and of the attack of Satan. And then in verses 35 down to verse 38, he prepares them for service and for suffering. Turn to the book of the Acts. And for completeness, we'll just read a verse or two in Acts chapter 2. Very familiar. Verse number 42, Acts 2, 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in the fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. That's the actual wording there. Turn to chapter 20, the same book. Verse number 6, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days. Now notice they came in five days, and we abode seven days, and upon the first day of the week. So apparently they waited, they came on a, perhaps on a Tuesday, waited till Lord's Day, when the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, that is not the main thrust of my message, but I'll just mention it here. The gathering we see here had priority over time. A busy man, a very busy schedule, yet he waits five days. Doesn't just decide, well, we'll break bread on Wednesday because it's much more convenient. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Had priority over time. Had priority over persons. They came together not to hear Paul, but to break bread. Paul was a side benefit of the meeting. Their purpose was to break bread. It had priority as well over place. They came to Troas where there was an assembly. And you can go through the things that we have here. 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, rather maybe chapter 10 might be better. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It is very encouraging to see so many, and so far everyone is awake. I will keep my eyes open, but uh, thus far everyone is awake. If I, get, if I get a hymn in the midst of my message, it's to wake you up. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion, the participation, the fellowship of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion, same word, of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And then finally, chapter 11. Break in at verse number 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, meaning they weren't really observing it. For eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say? Shall I praise you in that? I praise you not. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, 
the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, new covenant in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, is the idea there, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, in an unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, and so on. Now God will bless the reading of these very familiar portions of the Word of God to all of us. If you happen to be in the country of Belgium, in the city of Ypres, every night, 8 o'clock, since 1928, at the Menin Gate, they sound what's called the last post. That is the equivalent of our taps that is linked with ceremony and is linked with honoring those who have died. In 1928, the officials of the city decided to get together to honor the quarter million Allied soldiers who had died defending that city during the First World War. And so from 1928 on, the same place, the same time, every night, there's a ceremony where they sound what we've referred to as our, the equivalent of our taps, but there it is called the last post. The entire character of the city is overshadowed by that one ceremony. It has become a tradition. It is what has stamped itself upon the city, and it has become known as the city of peace as a result of that. The city claims that it not only looks back to honor those who have died defending the city, but it also looks forward, giving everyone in Europe a, a ray of hope. Now, I don't know how they handled World War II when it came, but nevertheless, their idea is it looks back and it looks forward. And everything about that city is determined, is colored, is characterized by a nightly ceremony carried out at the gate. Everything about assembly life is colored by what we do on a Lord's Day morning. So I want to speak in the little time I have. I hope I can convey what I have in mind for you ably enough. I want to speak about the centrality of the supper. The centrality of the supper. In many places, tomorrow morning, we will gather to remember the Lord Jesus. And because of human nature, there is a tremendous danger that what we do repetitively can become routine. And what we do routinely can become robotic. You just go almost on, automat on cruise control and you just go through it and you fail to appreciate what we are doing. I have sat in a morning meeting more than once and my mind is somewhere else. And we just go through motions. So I want to just bring you back then to this tremendous reality of the centrality of the supper. Now we don't have time to look at all the scriptures. I will just mention that in the Gospels, we read just one, one account in Luke. And you can tell me later why it's not in John. But we read the account in Luke. And there we have the initiation. The Lord Jesus initiating the supper. When we come to the book of the Acts... We have the implementation. They did it. And we were told when they did it, how they did it, who did it, and so on. So initiated in the Gospels, implemented when we come to the book of the Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the implications. Tomorrow morning when you take from that loaf and you drink from that cup, there are implications in what you're doing. You're just not going through a, a ritual. Not just going through a, a symbolic act. Far more than that. There are implications that 1 Corinthians 10 reminds us as to partaking of the bread and partaking of the cup. And then when we come to what we read together in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have the instruction, the illumination, what we're doing and why and how and so on. It's interesting that the breaking of bread is the only gathering of the assembly 
where we're told what to do and how to do it. You may say maybe the prayer meeting in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and there's a measure of truth to that, but I think especially when we come to the breaking of bread, we are given very, very clear instruction as to how we carry out that particular meeting. Now, just a, a, a word of caution. I don't want to suggest and put into your mind the idea that the breaking of bread is the most important meeting of the week. Scripture doesn't say that. Tragically, we have developed the mentality that as long as you come to the breaking of bread, you're in good standing in the assembly. And it doesn't matter about the gospel meeting or the prayer meeting or the Bible reading. or any, Just come to the breaking of bread and you're in good stead. Well, there is nothing in the Word of God that suggests Sunday morning only fellowship. And yet, as I am trying to impress upon you, what we do on a Lord's Day morning colors the entire character of an assembly in all of its activities, in all of its dealings. First of all, it is a declaration of our faith and hope. We are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. Now, in a Bible reading, it frequently comes up, who are we proclaiming it to? Angels? Everyone around us? We are proclaiming it to the universe. Our brother was reminding us to uh, put ourselves back in the time and those who were reading this epistle for the first time. They were reading it in a culture where people said, Christ on a cross? That is an absolute disgrace. That, that's the epitome of weakness. That's the epitome of folly. Here were people who were saying that cross. That cross is the most important event in history. I am banking my eternity upon that cross. They were proclaiming the Lord's death to, the, to a hostile culture, to a disinterested universe, whoever it may be. We are proclaiming his death till he comes. And we are showing, we are showing our fellowship together with the body and blood of Christ. The symbols, they are symbols. That's all they are, they're symbols. We have a number of symbols left to us, a body of order for baptism, a head covering for the, for the female, the uncovered head of the male, the bread and the cup, five symbols left for New Testament believers, and they are all types and shadows were all disappeared at Calvary, but now we're left with symbols. They are symbols. They are separate, a cup and a loaf of bread. And not only are they separate, but they are significant. Time doesn't permit, but let me just mention this. Christ is so great. He is so incomprehensible in, his, in the fullness of his person that he's never defined by one thing. It takes two rivers to tell us of his salvation. The Red Sea that brought them out, the Jordan that brought them in. It takes two priests, Aaron and Melchizedek. It takes two leaders, Moses and Joshua. It takes two kings, David and Solomon. You go through the list. He is so great in this person that it requires all of this to begin to give us some understanding of his work, of his person, of his efficacy, of his priesthood, of his kingship, all of that. And so we have these two symbols left to us to help us identify or to declare our hope and our faith. But it displays our obedience. Now, it should not just be a matter of duty, but it is a command. Hey, I have received, Paul says, I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus Christ said, this do. You've all read the book, His Dying Request. Really, it's a command. This do in remembrance of me. We have the order. We have its observation. Who, who partakes of it? When it's done, where it's done. Always linked with a local assembly. That's why Paul didn't break, bread, didn't break bread on ship. That's why he waited five days at Troas to be with the assembly, to remember the Lord, to break bread together with them. And so it's not a matter just of convenience. That is why maybe young believers have a question. Why was it during the pandemic when we couldn't meet together, we didn't just all break bread in our homes? You know, there's three or four of us in our house that are saved. We could have, break, we could have had a breaking of bread. And uh, it is always linked with a testimony because it is, it is one of the vital things that a, an assembly testifies to. That's just one reason. Others we'll see in a few moments. It defines our fellowship. And I'm going to come back to that in a few moments. It dignifies our gatherings. We are gathered to a person to remember his death. Here upon earth... When men want to be remembered, usually they erect something huge or 
people name things after them, families name things after them to be remembered. You've all been through O'Hare Airport, named after O'Hare. JFK Airport in New York. George W. Bush, Houston. Go through the litany of them. Great monuments to men. What did the Lord Jesus Christ leave as a memorial to himself? Loaf of bread and a cup. The most accessible, the most available elements in any culture in the world. Even poverty does not hinder having a loaf of bread and a cup. The tremendous humility and grace of the Lord Jesus, even in the symbols in which he, that he, he gave us, we are to do it in a, a manner that is worthy. Now, that does not mean that we are worthy. We are unworthy, but we are to do it in a manner that is worthy, meaning we appreciate what we're doing. We're not just coming together to, to carry out our meetings, but we're doing it in light of the Word of God and in light of all that it means to partake. And we are doing it with utmost simplicity. It details our doctrines. Now, I know I'm going hurriedly, but you'll forgive me. This is not a matter of a pat on the back or look how good we are. Far from it. God knows our weakness, our failure. But we have been preserved in large measure from false doctrine concerning the person of Christ. And I think one reason is because on a Lord's Day morning, and I don't want you doing this tomorrow morning and get distracted, but on a Lord's Day morning, as brother after brother rises to his feet to give thanks to God for, for the Lord Jesus, we, deta we repeat all of the essential doctrines concerning the person of Christ. One person gets up and speaks about his eternal sonship. Another gets up and rises and talks about his virgin birth, his impeccability, his perfect character, his service that was so delightful to God, the value of his death, the reality of his resurrection, his coming, all of that. We go through an entire systematic theology on a Lord's Day morning without even realizing it. And as we repeat those doctrines week after week, they preserve us. Because, you see, an assembly is pillar and ground of the truth. It is the pillar to uphold. It is the bulwark to protect. And the best way to protect doctrine is to proclaim doctrine. The best way to preserve doctrine is to publish doctrine. And as we publish it, as we proclaim it, we are preserving it for generations to come. May the Lord help us in all of that. And so it details our doctrines. But what I want to come to especially is what it develops in believers. Number one. It should develop harmony among the saints. It should develop harmony among the saints. We're expressing fellowship, aren't we, as we sit together. Now, I may get in trouble for saying this. We do not gather in a circle because the Lord is in the midst. The Lord is in the midst right now, and there's no circle. The Lord is in the midst at every gathering. But we are giving, by our physical appearance expression to a spiritual reality that we are united together. We are taking sides with Christ against the world. Paul speaks of those within, those without. And as we gather together, we are within. But something else. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I know that uh, this is not often referred to when we think of the Lord's Supper, but Paul says there in 1 Corinthians... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we being many are one bread, one body. Why? Because we are all partakers of that one bread. So tomorrow morning, if we're spared, and you take your portion from the bread, what you are saying, what you are professing is, I am in fellowship with everyone else who partakes of that loaf. We being many are one bread, one body. That's a local company. That's not the whole body of Christ. That's a local company because we're all partaking. The whole church, the body of Christ doesn't partake of the loaf. A local body of believers partakes of the loaf. So when you reach out your hand and take from the loaf, you are saying, I am in fellowship with everyone else who is partaking from this loaf. Now, the challenge. If I am putting out my arm and hand and taking from the loaf, is it possible that I will not put out my hand and shake a person's hand? There's a disconnect there, right? I mean, if you're taking from the loaf and they're taking from the loaf, but we, we, but we don't speak to each other because we don't really get along and it's best to... You don't have to be best buds. 
but you're in fellowship. That's what, you, that's what you've just professed, that you're in fellowship, that you're one. And yet, well, I, I, we've got to keep our distance. So partaking of the loaf on the Lord's Day morning, it should develop harmony among the believers. Secondly, it should develop humility of spirit. Ever sit at a Lord's Day morning? Think of the cross. Think of how men treated the Lord Jesus Christ. And think, that's my heart. That's what I am like basically as a sinner. That I would buffet the face of the Son of God. That I would tear him from his throne if possible. That I would scourge him and cry crucify him. That all that I see of how men treated Christ is just a reflection, just a reflection of my natural heart. It should bow us in shame to think that we, we, the, the pinnacle of God's creation, took the Creator, despised, esteemed Him not, set Him at naught, treated Him as not only, not only of being a sinner, but being unworthy of even life in His own creation. So as we see it, as we look at it, we should have a fresh appreciation of the grace of God and it should humble us in his presence to consider all that we did to him. To make me aware as well, relative to my humility that I should develop, an awareness of my helplessness, that apart from that cross, apart from what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary, I was a totally helpless, hopeless sinner. No hope in myself. All self-effort, all hopes of attaining and pleasing God in myself, all in vain. And so as I come and look at the cross once more on a Lord's Day morning, it should create in me a humility of spirit, a deep appreciation for the grace of God and what it has done. What about holiness of life? Do you and I leave a breaking of bread with a desire to be more holy? Do we see afresh the awfulness of sin as we think that sin is such a horrid thing that when the Lord Jesus Christ became responsible for sin, he knew no, no mercy. He knew no mitigating of the wrath of God. He knew no lessening, of, no compromising of God's character that somehow because he was the son and because sin was placed upon him, that mercy, that, that, that God's justice could somehow skip over. Or, or lessen, or somehow just make his sufferings a token for the whole. As you look at Calvary, we realize how awful sin is in the sight of God. That's what's endemic to your soul and to mine. And as you look at those two emblems, as you look at the cup, it should remind us of what was taken away. That cup took my sins away. Or rather, what that cup represents took my sins away. But also what it brought in. It brought in tremendous blessing. It's a, the new, this is the, whether you're reading in, which of the Gospels are you reading in here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11? This cup is the, new, is the new covenant shed for the remission of sins. So it took something away. But it part, as the cup of the new covenant, it brought in tremendous blessings. So I'm, I'm reminded there in the cup, that my sins required the Lord Jesus to die. But then as I look at the bread, I'm reminding of a substitute. He not only died for my sins, he died for me, all I am as a person. He died for my sin, my, all that I was put away in that one mighty sacrifice. And so as I look at the cross, I am brought face to face with the reality of my, my awful sin. We have to recognize the awfulness of sin. Not to be toyed with, not to be flirted with, but to be judged. So we should leave a breaking of bread in harmony with our brethren, humbled in our spirits, holiness becoming really a tremendous desire for our souls. But as well, our hands should be strengthened in service. Paul could speak there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ constrains me. Now that was not Paul's love for Christ. 
It was Christ's love for Paul. As Paul thought of the love of Christ, it constrained him in service. Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ himself say, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Service should spring from worship. Service should spring from an appreciation of what the cross has meant, what the cross has brought in. And so love for Christ constraining. When we leave our breaking of bread, it should have inspired us, stirred us, strengthened us to want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ more effectively. C.T. Studd, along with what our brother mentioned about electronic media and the fact that it has blunted and hindered memorization, it has also hindered reading. And I wish I could get a generation of young people to read biographies of Christians of a former age. They may be a bit out of date, they may be a little bit different than the way we live, but they can be tremendously inspiring. C.T. Studd left behind a fortune. He left behind fame. He was the equivalent of an all-American football player, but it was cricket, and it's in England, and he was an all-England cricket star. And someone could sometime explain to me the game of cricket. I cannot understand it at all. But anyway, he left that all behind and went out as a missionary. India, China. He said, if Jesus Christ is God, and he died for me. No sacrifice I make is too great. If Jesus Christ is God and he died for me, no sacrifice that I can make is too great. I have to confess sometimes that uh, I sing lies. I think there's no time that we are so guilty of untruth as when we're singing. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. And I get up from the Lord's table and I talk to somebody about their new car. Really? We all do it, don't we? And yet we sing those words. Had I a thousand hearts to give, Lord, they should all be thine. I have trouble with one. Not, not, let's speak of a thousand. It should strengthen our hands for service. It should give us a look at the eternal. It should remind us of the character of the world and make us more devoted in our service for the Lord Jesus Christ. My time is gone. I don't want to intrude on my brother's time. I wasn't... Well, I'll say this with a confession because the last one I have to confess is total totally foreign to me. Not only should it create harmony, not only should it create humility, not only should it encourage holiness, not only should it strengthen my hands in service, but it should make us homesick for heaven. And I have to confess, I'm not there. But it should make us homesick for heaven. To have a look at the Lord Jesus Christ, if this glimpse of love is so divinely sweet, what will it be, O Lord, above thy gladdening smile to me? May God help us, encourage us, and prevent us from having the repetitive become the routine, the routine become the robotic. May we remember the Lord Jesus Christ in a manner worthy of all he has done.